Hello there my RPG lovers and welcome to another video. 2006 was an amazing year for gaming in general. A ton of quality titles from basically all genres saw the release date during this year. Titan Quest was definitely not that big of a release compared to some of these industry giants but the reception of this game was pretty good. But apparently it was not good enough for THQ, the publisher for the game, to greenlit the sequel to Titan Quest, which was actually in development. The reception from critics, and especially the players, was quite positive in general. The game was praised for phenomenal replay value, very solid gameplay, and amazing presentation. You shall find your answer. Some of the major critiques for the game were related to bare bones online play and the lack of originality because Titan Quest is just another Diablo 2 clone. But I think both of those arguments are kinda redundant. Even though this game has an online co-op mode, it's very clear that the main focus is on single player experience, and I think there is nothing wrong with that. As for the quote unquote shameless Diablo clone argument that some critics used back then, well I guess people still didn't realize that Diablo created a brand new subgenre of RPGs. That narrative was quick to change in the following years because we got to see a lot more of these quote unquote shameless Diablo clones. Anyway, in the following year, Titan Quest received a huge expansion called Immortal Throne. And it was a great addition to the base game because it added some new content and made some great changes to the gameplay in general. Even though the reception of the base game and the expansion was pretty good, Iron Lore Entertainment, the studio behind Titan Quest, had to close down because of the inability to secure funding for its next project. Like I said, Titan Quest 2 was supposed to be a thing, but at the time, THQ believed that PC gaming was dead and that top-down action RPGs were antiquated. Yeah, for real. If you watched my retrospective video for Grim Dawn last year, you might remember me talking about this. I was lucky enough to get this exclusive info from Arthur Bruno, the CEO of Crate Entertainment. That's the development studio for Grim Dawn, the spiritual successor to Titan Quest. When the pitch for Titan Quest 2 failed, they tried to make another game that's more focused on action combat, and that game was supposed to be called Black Legion. According to Arthur Bruno, Black Legion had a third-person camera and more action-oriented fighting system with various brutal finishing moves. THQ Green lead this project, but suddenly they dropped the project because they'd acquired Big Huge Games, who were working on a big budget RPG. Big Huge Games is the studio behind Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning, by the way. Your foolishness knows no bounds. Shortly after this, Iron Lore had to close down, but THQ suffered a similar fate. They got acquired by Nordic Games and assumed the name THQ Nordic, the publisher company that's still very active today. A couple of key people from Iron Lore, like Arthur Bruno, created a brand new development studio called Create Entertainment and managed to secure the funding for the new RPG called Grim Dawn on Kickstarter. That's a quite interesting story behind the studio and the publisher of Titan Quest, but there is a happy ending behind the story after all. Grim Dawn is basically a spiritual successor to Titan Quest and even Black Legion is not completely off the table, it might still happen someday in the future. At least that's one of the things which Arthur Bruno mentioned when I got in touch with him. When it comes to Titan Quest, THQ Nordic released some brand new expansions in the past couple of years for this 16 years old game. Three full blown expansions to be more exact. Ragnarok in 2017, Atlantis in 2019 and Eternal Embers in 2021. Only one of those three new expansions has mostly positive reviews on Steam, while others have mixed reviews. But we'll get to that eventually. THQ Nordic did a great job with various new patches for the game, quality of life improvements, and they also ported this game to other consoles. This is not so strange when it comes to THQ Nordic, they did a similar thing with Kingdoms of Amalur as well. With that being said, let's go back to the beginning and start talking about the game itself. You there, soldier! If you've come looking for rest and peace, you won't find it here in Helos. Before I got to play Titan Quest, top-down action RPGs were never my thing. This game single-handedly changed my mind about Diablo-like RPGs in general. The reason why I decided to try this game out in the first place was the Greek mythology setting and the vibrant color palettes. I don't know if this is nostalgia speaking, but there is something very pleasant about this time period when it comes to graphics in RPGs. My three most played RPGs from that time period were Oblivion, Gothic 3 and Titan Quest. I think it's not so hard to notice the similarities between these games when it comes to the color palettes. Anyway, Titan Quest is a great example of how the artistic style is much more important than the sheer graphical fidelity. This is why the game matched so well and I think most people will agree on this. I wouldn't call this art style cartoony, even though it might seem like that, just because of the vibrant colors. 
it's more of a semi-realistic art style and it seemed like it was a great design decision considering how well it stood the test of time. When it comes to the graphical fidelity itself, if you're playing this game on a higher resolution, you're going to see some very crisp textures. To put it this way, if this game came out today, I don't think a lot of people will complain about the visuals. But as always, you can see the true age of these games by just looking at the character models. This aspect of the game is one of those things that didn't age so well, but that's really common for the majority of older RPGs. Some of these character models look really rough, like, what the hell is that? Everyone asks where the monsters came from. It is clear as day, they were sent by the enemies of the gods. And some of these animations are really stiff, which makes the game look really goofy at times. Besides that, I think the graphics are more than passable even today, but I'm not a very demanding person when it comes to this game aspects. Playing this game in 4K resolution is just an amazing experience in general. There are some graphical effects which are definitely showing their age as well. The shadows are really simplistic even on the high settings and even the lighting in general is not all that great. The game has a day and night cycle which changes the mood of locations you're exploring quite a bit. But yeah, the outdated lighting techniques can definitely make the places you explore feel a bit flat for the lack of a better word. However, like I said, the textures on the environment are really crisp on higher resolutions and higher graphical settings, which makes them really pleasant to look at. Combined with the vibrant color palette, this game still manages to create a warm atmosphere that I personally find very pleasant and relaxing. Even though the main theme of Titan Quest is the Greek mythology, you'll get to visit the variety of different locations through 7 different acts. But even without those 3 new locations from the recent DLCs, the 4 acts of the base game are quite varied. You start in ancient Greece, then you go through Egypt, Orient, which is basically the Far East, with places like India, China and Japan. The Immortal Throne DLC, which is included in the Anniversary Edition by default, takes place in Hades Underworld. So yeah, the locations are really varied and all of them have a unique look, which makes the exploration amazing. That's something which was kinda hard to pull off in an isometric RPG. But having different looking locations is not enough to convince the player that he's not exploring the same map over and over again in an isometric RPG. That's where the verticality of the terrain comes into play. There is a very decent amount of verticality on these maps and it's just enough to not make the game world feel flat. And again, kinda hard to pull off in an isometric RPG even today, yet alone in 2006. The verticality is not crazy though, but it's just enough to not make the game world feel flat while exploring it. There are some locations where you can take the advantage of this by shooting enemies with ranged abilities or weapons from above. Another big reason why the locations feel so varied is the insane amount of different looking enemy types that you're going to encounter. I think that's really important in every RPG basically, but especially when it comes to these types of games where killing things is like 99% of the game. I don't know how big was the budget for the game, but Titan Quest truly felt like a AAA RPG back then. Every character is fully voice acted, the presentation in general was great, and the game felt complete upon release. Yeah, imagine that. The story itself can be described in a similar manner. It's pretty decent for ARPG standards, where you don't need a lot of context for killing things over and over again, and load better gear to kill more stuff on greater difficulty. That being said, I still think the game is worth playing just for the campaign itself, and that's exactly how I played it back then. My perspective was entirely different, and I didn't know exactly what's the deal with these games, and why people tend to replay them on higher difficulties. But I was completely satisfied by just going through the story of the game a couple of times with different characters. And only then I started noticing why it's so satisfying to sink so many hours into these types of games. So if you're not exactly a fan of grinding in Diablo-like RPGs, you can still enjoy this game by just going through the main story. The story itself has a really simple premise. Telkins are trying to release the Titans, which are a great threat to the world. The Telkins are these ancient wizards that you're going to fight throughout the game. And that's pretty much everything you need to know about the story. You're going to fight various creatures from the Greek and different mythologies, as well as regular beasts who are corrupted by the Telkins. There is a plethora of side quests as well, but there are just another cheap excuse to kill some more monsters. That doesn't mean they are not worth doing because you'll usually get to fight a stronger monster which has a higher chance to drop something useful. You'll find yourself completing a lot of side quests by just exploring the map and killing things. The map in Titan Quest is completely open and it feels like a true open world RPG. There is a fog of war which kinda encourages you to explore each and every corner of the map. All maps in the game have a wide areas to explore and a lot of caves. Titan Quest can put a lot of similar games at shame because it doesn't have any loading screens. 
Whether you're entering cities, open areas or caves, which usually have at least a couple of levels, everything feels completely seamless. Well, that's not entirely true, since I had some noticeable FPS drops while entering caves, which was definitely annoying. For the most part, my PC can run this game on 4K on high settings with no issues, but these frame drops are very consistent when entering and leaving caves for some reason. Speaking of caves, I always like the design of them. Going through these caves never felt pointless to me because there is always a nice chance to get some good piece of gear, either from monsters or various chests. Speaking of gear that comes from monsters you kill, there is a very nice attention to detail which makes the process of looting things a lot more enjoyable in general. Everything you see on a monster will drop when you kill them. Weapons and armors have physical assets, which automatically drop when the monster is killed. This means that you can usually notice a special item on an NPC, and you know you can loot it when you get to kill that particular NPC. I found this extremely satisfying and it's one of the reasons why I like to play with a more zoomed in camera. I mean you won't get to miss those items even if you don't pay attention to this, because you'll kill the NPCs regardless and the items will drop. But still, I think it's a really nice attention to detail which adds a really nice flavor to the gameplay. And speaking of the gameplay, let's start talking about it, finally. The gameplay in Diablo-like action RPGs tend to age a lot better compared to some other games in the RPG genre. If killing monsters feels enjoyable by just holding the left mouse button, your game is on a good road to become a decent action RPG. And if you have a good progression system on top of that, which allows you to build and play your character in a lot of different ways, it's not so hard to see why these games have a such great longevity. The action gameplay in Titan Quest is not exactly amazing by today's standards, but it still manages to offer a very decent experience. This game plays like pretty much every Diablo-like action RPG. You use your mouse for movement and basic attacks, and you can bind your abilities and consumables to whatever key combination you prefer. Ever since Titan Quest got ported to consoles, it also got a full controller support, obviously. So this time around I really wanted to test the game out with a controller on the PC and I beat the whole game like that. I didn't have a lot of problems while playing like this and it was definitely a lot more comfortable experience. But I still prefer playing games of this type with mouse and keyboard because it's usually a lot superior experience. Especially if you're going to play a ranged character because aiming a ranged weapon feels more natural with a mouse cursor. Same goes for plethora of abilities that require a bit of aiming and positioning. It's kinda easy to mess up your aiming on abilities with a controller, which happened quite often on my playthrough. The thing is, THQ Nordic already has a solution for this problem on console ports. You can simply hold the button for the ability you wish to cast and you'll get this very useful highlight. For some odd reason that's not working on the PC, even though everything else transforms into a console-like experience when you plug in a controller. Long story short, I recommend playing Titan Quest on PC with mouse and keyboard. But the controls are not the only thing which makes Titan Quest more playable on the PC. What's perhaps the biggest quality of life improvement is the option to increase the game speed. And as far as I'm aware, this option is exclusive to PC. The feel of the gameplay in Titan Quest was always on the slower side, especially in the early game. I never thought this was a huge issue, but this was one of the reasons why the controls can feel a bit unresponsive. The way your character controls in this game was never that snappy. It always felt to me like there was a slight input lag and the transition between some animations can make the feel of the gameplay a bit clumsy. Especially in this case when I'm playing a ranged character who is trying to kite enemies and use abilities in a very tight window where I'm trying to not get hit. Instead of pressing the ability button once, I usually feel the need to spam the ability button, especially in these situations. The game speed option is trying to mitigate some of these problems, but it's far from a perfect solution. What's interesting about the Anniversary Edition on PC is the default game speed option. THQ set the game speed on fast by default. So apparently THQ Nordic thought the normal game speed was way too slow for today's standards. Like I said, this is not exactly the best solution for the problem which THQ tried to fix for a couple of reasons. You can feel a very steep difficulty curve in some cases and the faster game speed is the main reason for that. 
some enemies can simply one shot you or stun lock you and you simply don't have enough time to react because it can feel extremely fast. I guess it doesn't happen that often, but when it does, it can be really frustrating. The normal game speed makes the gameplay a bit more tactical in those situations. But outside of those situations, the normal game speed can feel really sluggish if you got used to the fast game speed, which is on by default. You can play around with the game speed and see what suits you the best, but I would recommend leaving it on fast. When it comes to consoles, there is no such option in the game menu, so the game speed is on normal by default. I have the Switch version of the game as well, and I have to admit that it's hard to get used to the normal game speed after I played the game on fast on my PC. The Nintendo Switch hardware is probably too weak to try and render the textures on the faster speed, but that's not an excuse when it comes to stronger consoles. I did some research and it seems like the PS5 and PS4 version of the game lack this option as well. So yeah, the normal speed of the game can definitely feel a bit slower compared to some newer action RPGs, so I recommend getting this game on the PC if you want to try it out. When it comes to the gameplay itself, Dual Mastery System is hands down the best part about it. The idea of combining two different masteries however you see fit is amazing. The way it works is pretty simple, you get 3 points to invest in masteries of your choice each time you level up. You can choose to dump those points into the mastery itself, which gives you stat bonuses, or you can invest them in passive and active abilities. But you have to unlock those abilities by investing points into mastery first. It's a lot simpler than it sounds. If you have all DLCs, you'll have 11 masteries in the game, and you can mix and match them however you want. Each combination of masteries gets a unique name. My character is Pilgrim, which is the combination of hunting and Naden masteries. Some combinations have a much better synergy than others, which is usually more noticeable on higher difficulties. But you can choose to play whatever seems interesting to you and still complete the game on normal difficulty. Speaking about difficulties, Titan Quest is no joke, even on normal difficulty. It heavily depends on your build and especially the gear you manage to obtain, but you can't exactly blast through the whole game on the default difficulty. Even though some parts of the early game could make you believe otherwise, like the moment I got this bow from the Medusa boss. I started shredding enemies left and right with no issues, but after a while my damage was not all that great. This creates a very enjoyable progression system in the game. You can feel your character getting stronger when you level up and get better items, which is really important in pretty much all RPGs. Another reason for that is the lack of aggressive level scaling of enemies. There is still a very small threshold for level scaling on enemies, they can go up to 5 levels or something like that, but that's pretty much it. This also means that if you decide to blast through the main quest, you can find yourself in a slight disadvantage. But that's only the case if you're trying to rush through the game and skip a lot of zones and enemies. I really took my time with this character and I didn't do any grinding actually. But when I got to Hades, which is the fourth act of the game, I felt that my damage was a bit low. This was mostly because I was not so lucky with the items I got, but my level was also a bit lower compared to the enemies here. And my build was not so great either, I just wanted to try out the new mastery. It doesn't seem like an amazing fit with hunting mastery, but still, the game was perfectly manageable with zero grinding for items, at least on the normal difficulty. Titan Quest has some decent boss fights throughout the campaign, but they are not so amazing compared to boss fights in modern action RPGs. These boss fights are good enough to offer you some challenge, but don't expect to find some boss mechanics like in Path of Exile or in Lost Ark, it's nothing that crazy. By the way, I think that Lost Ark is a garbage game, but if I'm trying to be objective, the boss fights in this game are just bloody amazing. Literally everything else outside of boss fights is garbage, but there you go. And yeah, I know this is not exactly a Diablo-like game, it's an MMORPG, but it plays like a Diablo-like RPG with MMO features on top of it. The mechanics of these boss fights are just on another level, and I would definitely expect future Diablo-like RPGs to have similar boss mechanics. That's why I'm kinda worried about Diablo 4, even though the gameplay clips look very good for that game. Anyway, the boss fights in Titan Quest are definitely a big step in difficulty compared to regular mobs in the game. The majority of abilities which bosses are using can be avoided by just positioning and kiting, but a lot of them also have some unavoidable abilities that will hit you no matter what. These kinds of abilities are usually called gear checks, which means that if you don't have strong enough equipment, you'll die no matter what. And again, this is mostly for higher difficulties in the game. You won't exactly get one-shotted on the normal difficulty when you get hit by these abilities. I was never a huge fan of unavoidable damage in fights, because it always feels extremely cheap. 
Anyway, to truly experience some serious challenge in Titan Quest, you will need to unlock new difficulties by beating the game. Higher difficulties require you to optimize your gear and build a lot better compared to the normal difficulty. It's not a perfect way to do difficulties, but the majority of Diablo-like action RPGs used to work like this. I think this trend started to die out a little bit in recent years. Path of Exile used to have cruel and merciless difficulty levels and that became a single 10-act playthrough game. Even Grim Dawn has a way to jump through difficulty levels by using a particular item. And I'm pretty sure that Diablo 4 won't have the same difficulty levels like Diablo 3. While having multiple difficulties in these types of games is not a perfect way to balance out the game, I'm still not entirely convinced that alternative methods are better. To sum it up, the default difficulty of Titan Quest is pretty decent. It's not too hard or too easy and it managed to stay challenging throughout the campaign. The character progression system gives you a good feel of your power level going up from leveling and finding new items. Speaking of items, you'll have some important things to loot besides armors and weapons. Titan Quest has many different charms which are used for creating a powerful item. You'll always get these charms in pieces so you'll have to combine a couple of them to fully complete the charm. Then you can use them with different formulas which can create a powerful item which will boost your power level quite a bit. If you got used to games like Grim Dawn and Path of Exile, you're probably going to think that gameplay systems in Titan Quest are a lot simpler. I don't think that's a bad thing though. Sure, Titan Quest doesn't have a huge constellation system like Grim Dawn or insane passive tree like Path of Exile but it still offers you a lot of different ways to play your character. The modern design of Diablo-like action RPGs can be really intimidating for new players of this genre. That's why I think that Titan Quest is an amazing starting point if you wish to get into this genre. When it comes to new expansions, the Ragnarok is easily my personal favorite. But to be honest, all of them just feel like an additional reason to come back to the game for another playthrough. That doesn't mean that THQ didn't think about the endgame activities. The Eternal Embers, which was the last DLC for the game, is exclusive for level 70 characters. But if you don't have a high level character already and you want to experience this new piece of content, you can just make a level 70 character. Same goes for Ragnarok DLC, you can make a new level 40 character and jump right in. The only problem with this, and it's actually a big problem, is the equipment or the lack of it. If this is your first character, you obviously don't have any gear in the storage and hard difficulties are pretty harsh, especially for a character with no freaking gear. THQ Nordic kinda had this in mind so they included some epic gear in the first two chests of Eternal Embers DLC. But still, if you're a new player you will get stomp on regardless of this because you don't know what you're doing. It's not exactly an ideal solution and that's one of the reasons for a lot of negative reviews on Steam. The other reason why Atlantis and Eternal Embers are not so well received on Steam are technical issues and the underwhelming quality of these DLCs in general I guess. The content in these DLCs is definitely not amazing but I wouldn't call it bad. Some people call them a nostalgia bait and a cash grab. I wouldn't go so far because for this to be the case, the quality of the new content would have to be really bad. And I don't think that's the case with these DLCs, even though they are not exactly very good. Like I said before, there are good enough reasons for another playthrough of Titan Quest, especially if you played this game a long time ago. More locations and new monsters to kill is the way I think of them to be honest. I did enjoy the switch to Norse mythology in the Ragnarok DLC quite a bit and the Atlantis DLC has some really pretty locations. Putting Eternal Embers aside, THQ did include some new content that's aimed towards high level characters. The Atlantis DLC added a horde mode called Tartarus. To be honest, I was never a huge fan of horde mods in general so I don't really like it but it's a good way to farm some unique gear if that's your thing. I prefer to play the campaign and do boss runs. Speaking of that, each DLC has a brand new campaign to go through and new regions to discover. Most of the new regions are looking amazing. New DLCs also added a couple of new masteries that you can try out like Naden and Rune Master. Like I said before, my character is the mix of hunting and Naden mastery but I'm not a huge fan of this mix. I only figured that out very late in my playthrough. Naden seems like a very boring mastery to be honest. Rune Master seems like a much more interesting mastery but don't quote me on that because I still didn't try it out. Here's a little tip for trying out the mastery combinations. Just go ahead and make a new level 70 character if you have the Eternal Embers DLC or level 40 character if you only have Ragnarok DLC and test out the masteries a bit. To sum up the DLCs, Ragnarok feels like a full blown expansion and is the best in my opinion. Atlantis is probably the worst out of all three DLCs because it kinda feels underdeveloped. But it probably has the most beautiful zones to explore and some people might like the new horde mode it offers. I personally was not a huge fan. I still didn't form a complete opinion about Eternal Embers DLC because I'm still playing through it. 
I still don't know how to feel about the expansion that's exclusive to Legendary difficulty, it's a ballsy decision to say the least. You would think it's a huge fan service to OG players of the game, but it's not exactly a good idea to disregard everyone else. It's a terrible idea actually. The bottom line is, I would suggest to get the anniversary edition of the game, and if you like it enough once you're done with the campaign, get Ragnarok DLC first. You can always choose to get the next two DLCs after that if you want to get more content. The music in the game is pretty damn good, even amazing sometimes, depending on the track. I selected a couple of my favorite songs from the game as a background for this video, but you'll get to hear a lot more amazing soundtracks in the game. All of the soundtracks are very fitting for the mood which the zone you're exploring are trying to depict. So besides the visuals, the music is also responsible for creating a very nice atmosphere in the game of course. I wish I could say the same for sound effects, but they are decent at best. The sound effects in combat don't lack that oomph, which gives the attacks a nice sense of weight. But the general quality of the sound effects is decent at best, like I said. They managed to make the low health sound effect very depressing, at least that's how it sounds to me. I already mentioned the voice acting before, it's average at best. This isn't the first petition I've received requesting assistance. These beasts are everywhere now. You won't get to hear a ton of voice acting though, because the quests are few and far between. It's good enough to not ruin your experience and to break the monotony of killing things every once in a while. Literally zero memorable characters though. And a hero yet takes the bet to break the evil's better. Titan Quest will always be one of those games that I like to revisit from time to time for another playthrough. Even after 16 years, this game looks pretty to look at and the gameplay is still very decent. Sure, the gameplay systems are not that complex like in Grim Dawn or Path of Exile, but it still manages to offer an enjoyable character progression. Thanks to the dual mastery system, which is by itself a huge reason to replay the game over and over again, just to try out a different build. We're probably never going to see a sequel for this game and that makes me really sad. Grim Dawn is the closest thing to a sequel because the game works on the same engine, so I would highly recommend checking it out when you're done with Titan Quest. Anyway, tell me your opinion about Titan Quest in the comments below. Do you plan to revisit the game in the current year and maybe try out these new DLCs? Or maybe you plan to try out the game for the first time ever? Leave a comment down below. Don't forget to subscribe for more RPG contents. If you want to support the channel in the long run, consider becoming a Patreon or a YouTube member. You can get your name on the end credits as well as some other perks like early access to videos, Discord roles, my plans for future content, etc. etc. That will be all and I'll see you in the next one.